What is going on? It's Alex coming back at you with another video. And today we're going to be breaking down the best and worst performances in college football for this week number nine. If you are new, feel free to like, comment, and subscribe. You guys know how to use YouTube. Again, still under concussion protocol for those of y'all who do know. Um, ended up in a pretty bad car accident just a little bit over a week ago. So thank you guys so much for the love and support. If you guys do want to support me, feel free to use the Venmo on the link tree. But if you guys don't want to actually spend any money on me, Actually, make some money on yourself. Use that top link for that underdog discount. You get up to $1,000 in bonus cash and they send me 60 bucks. So that's a great way to do it. And it boosts the brand. So let's get on into it. Um, let's just have a good time here. Starting out with our stars of the week. Tedro McMillan, of course, is back on here. He's just been like consistently popping up, popping down. Just depends on how well Safita uses this poor guy. But this past week, he had 14 targets, 10 receptions, 202 yards and a touchdown. So bottom line, much more efficient. This is also a better week for Fafita, who's been really struggling big time this year. So glad to see at least there is some form of progression there because we all love Fafita. Now, continuing on, Travis Hunter. So some familiar faces. Uh, he had a great uh, he had a great game on both sides of the ball this week on defense. He was targeted six times, allowed two completions for nine yards and had a couple pass breakups. Not mistaken, he was the top graded defender on Colorado. On top of that, on the offensive side, he was targeted nine times, caught nine balls for 153 yards and two touchdowns. So a, an amazing game balanced on both sides of the ball. Big fan of what Travis Hunter is doing. Of course, that's what makes him so damn special. Hopefully he can get his weight up a little bit in the NFL unless he wants to be like if he wants to be a pure corner, if he wants to be more of that receiver type, which I assume he will, this is a perfect build for him. Now, Jarquez Hunter is next. Not a guy who I suspected talking about, but um, he ended up going off this week. He had five or four catches on five targets for 19 yards, but this is the big kicker. 23 carries, 278 yards and two touchdowns with six mix, missed tackles forced. Um, pretty much one of the only reasons Auburn was even competitive that game. The whole entire offense went through Jarquez. So shout out to him. Um, he's been doing a fantastic job, but this week is really the precipice of everything. And it's kind of the encapsulation of what he does best, which is kind of carry a game on his back when he picks up some heat. Then you got Cayman Rucker, who also had a fantastic week. He had a 93 defensive grade with seven pressures, six defensive stops, one target, zero receptions, and an interception. Um, this is probably the best player of the week, but that's why we have stars. These are like the all-stars of the week. Shout out to Cameron Rucker. This dude's doing fantastic. Coming back from injury where he had a really slow uh, restart. So I'm glad to see him back in full form. Then we got D'Angelo Pons ending off our all-stars of the week. He actually had a really good week five versus Washington, but um, this week could not continue seeing him slip at 5'9", 170. I was like, man, he might be a little fluky, but... This week for Indiana, which they're now 8-0, if I'm not mistaken, or 9-0, excuse me, but uh, they're undefeated. He had a 93 defensive grade, a 93 coverage grade with three defensive stops, four targets, one reception allowed for four yards and two interceptions. Um, yeah, the first time I ever saw him, especially versus Washington, I thought this was going to be a little bit of a player that I would just like see once and not actually mention, but this guy's gone off multiple weeks this year. Definitely a name for us to watch going forward. Um, maybe he won't go in just the 250. Like that 170 range is very tough to say is draftable. But um, at the same time, he very well could be a top 100 player if he continues put, putting up performances like this. Then we're going to go for the rest of the stars of the week. Because we'll just call those all stars and these the stars. I guess it kind of makes sense because I have a lot more players. I had like probably 70 star up, like stock ups this week. Uh, starting out with Nick Scorton, he was supposed to be actually one of the stars of the week. I know that because I end up italicizing the guys who I think should be in that, that stars of the week territory. But seven pressures and four defensive stops, a big portion of why Texas A&M has really picked up speed since their very slow start. Elijah Roberts, another time that he's been mentioned on the show and another nine pressure performance that has gotten him on this list. Very easily could be a star of the week because he consistently gets nine pressures. If he ended up getting three stops, I would have put him on there and actually probably if we had to kick someone down, it probably would be D'Angelo Pons. <laughs> but I mean, D'Angelo did such a fantastic job. It looks like this is just a really good um, meeting of the minds or meeting of fate. So uh, nine pressures, fantastic performance and a very close win 
over Duke. Deuce Chestnut, another guy who I was really happy with his performance this week. Uh, he's been someone who has noted multiple times on my stock up sheet, but defensive back out of Syracuse. He ended up having an 88 coverage grade with four defensive stops, two targets, zero receptions allowed, and two pass breakups. That is called efficiency. Good job for Deuce being a very well-rounded player this week. Taylor Green, uh, one of the names I debated not putting on this week because he did have three turnover-worthy plays, but overall, I could not not put him on this list. 29 throws, 23 completions, 314 yards, five touchdowns, and an interception. Six big-time throws, three turnover-worthy plays with a 94 pass grade, eight rushes, 79 yards, a touchdown, and a fumble. Bottom line, six total touchdowns, just near 14 uh, or 400 yards of offense. And, um, you know, technically like four turnover-worthy plays with a fumble as well as three turnover-worthy throws. I'll take it. I'll take it. It's it is like a very big time performance when you do have that many turnover or that many big time throws. You do also have the risk of putting yourself at a turnover worthy play. Taylor Green has been very roller coastery, but we do know the ceiling is absolutely there. Arianti Urzuri back on the list again. Zero pressures allowed versus Maryland. 88 pass blocking grade. Shout out to him. He's been having a very, very, very solid season. Uh, Nico Reed. He's also doing a pretty damn good job. Not the first time I've mentioned him, I think, on the show, but he definitely is not the first time I mentioned him in my stock up list, just maybe not on the episode. Uh, he had an 82 defensive grade with a defensive pressure, three targets, zero receptions allowed, and two pass breakups. Uh, really solid performance overall. Again, zero yards allowed and two pass breakups. That's probably going to get you on this list. Brennan Presley, in a game where Oklahoma State lost to the Baylor, uh, the Baylor Bears, which is ridiculous. I mean, I could have technically put um, Ollie Gordon on here because he should have been able to just destroy Baylor, but we'll leave it as is. Uh, Brennan Presley was not a reason why they lost. 17 targets, 15 receptions, along with 183 yards and a touchdown. He was pretty much the one thing that went right for Oklahoma State. Then we have Dawson Pendergrass running back out of Baylor. He had six touches, so six, uh, six rushes, for 142 yards and a touchdown with three missed tackles forced. And you might say, like, well, was that touchdown run a 99? No, it was a 50-yard run. So he had five rushes for, what, 92 yards and potentially a touchdown. I forget if the 50-yard run was his touchdown. So that still alone is fantastic. And again, a big reason why Baylor was able to seal the deal. Uh, you know, when you have those big time plays that carries your momentum and that kind of stops the momentum of the other team. Brian Mays, defensive back out of Texas A&M, is also on this list. 88 defensive grade, two uh, receptions allowed on six targets for 32 yards, but he had a couple of interceptions. So shout out to him. Again, one of the main reasons why Texas A&M is still rolling and they are red hot. Trey Freeman, linebacker out of Duke, is finally at the bottom of this list. He could have been very well on the stars of the week when you look at this performance. A 94 defensive grade, a 96 coverage grade, a defensive stop, three targets, zero receptions, an interception, and a pass breakup. I mean, like, fantastic performance. And one of the main reasons why, I mean, we had a lot of issues because you guys know I'm an SMU alum. Uh, the quarterback did not do too well, Kevin Jennings, and Trey Freeman's one of the main reasons why his turnover-worthy plays were probably so high. So shout out to him doing a great job there at Duke. Uh, going into our stock down list, our dud of the week is Jaden Ott. He's just been like really bad, really bad. And it sucks because my bitch ass ended up putting a big bet on season, um, season yard holders or season yard markers. And the one I was really confident in is like, oh, yeah, Jaden Ott will he'll get over a thousand yards this year. He absolutely won't. He had 10 carries for 11 yards and zero missed tackles forced this past week has been an absolute non-factor. And it's embarrassing. I know he's coming back from an injury and all, but I mean, just embarrassing performance. And again, it's going to hurt my pocket, like because everybody else is doing a lot better. So, um, yeah, very unfortunate. Jaden Ott really pissed off on a personal level, but it is what it is. Uh, continuing on, there's not many guys who actually had for stock down. There were actually three players I have included on this list, the bottom three, that I didn't really think would be deserving of being on a stock down list, but there just weren't a ton of poor performances from notable players. Again, stock down is much harder to filter out rather than stock up. Stock up is like, oh, cool. This player that is a no-name actually performed well, so let's give him some credit. Versus stock down is like, well, you have to be a known commodity and then you have to perform poorly. So 
Kyle McCord, quarterback out of Syracuse. Uh, he starts out this list, has been having a really hot year. I think he leads both um, the FBS and both turnover the plays as well as big time throws. But this week, not so much on the second path, uh, second part of that. So he had a 42 pass grade, 64 throws, 35 completions, 321 yards. Not bad. Zero touchdowns, five interceptions. Woof. Uh, one big time throw, four turnover worthy plays. He did have five rushing yard, or five rushing attempts for 14 yards and a touchdown. So um, 321 yards, or excuse me, 335 yards, one total touchdown, five interceptions. Uh, not going to be what makes it into the NFL, in my opinion. I don't like, I got to look back. I got to see like what the threshold is for the final year of a quarterback's career and um, of these draftable quarterbacks careers, seeing the which ones did well and seeing like, what's that threshold to where like no actually solid picks ended, ended up having like this many big time throws, right? And I feel like five is that spot where I'm like, yeah, I feel like the guys who succeed in the NFL never threw five turnover worthy plays in a, in a specific game in their final year. Maybe in the first game, we might give a little grace, but after week one, I don't know if there have been any. So very intriguing idea. I don't know if you guys have that stat, but um, in time is definitely something I want to look up. Then we got the Ohio State running backs. We'll group them together here. Trey Henderson and Quinshawn Judkins. Both of them had 10 rushing attempts. Trey had 25 yards and a missed tackle and uh, missed tackle forced. And Quinshawn had 10 carries for 29 yards and two missed tackles forced. Bottom line, they should have been far, far more efficient. That game came down to the wire versus Nebraska. That is not even an elite team. It's just, um, this is like, I think, back-to-back -back weeks for Quinchon to be very unproductive. And that's not great for someone who should be almost like the bona fide RB2, the only other running back that I thought could have been worth a first-round pick, has now kind of pushed himself outside of the first round. Then you got Luther Burden. Uh, if you look at the receiving sheet, he could have easily been the worst player this week because... Three receptions on six targets for three yards. That also is um, a manufactured aspect of Missouri's offense that did not operate well at all. He also had two carries for 15 yards, but he had three missed tackles for. So uh, Luther Burns has been having a rough year. It is what it is, but, you know, still, it's not like he's still a first round player. It's just like the wow factor, in my opinion has kind of waned off on him. Cam Williams is next and back-to-back -back weeks on this list, back-to-back -back weeks allowing four pressures and um, he has 64 pass blocking grade this week. Not great, especially when you consider that it's versus Vanderbilt. And on the other side, Calvin Banks having a very solid performance with an 88 pass blocking grade and zero pressures allowed. Will Campbell and Emory Jones are next. We got a couple duos in here. We got the uh, Ohio State running backs and we have the LSU tackles. Both the LSU tackles allowed four pressures this week. Will Campbell allowed a 58 pass blocking grade, and then Memory Jones had a 67 pass blocking grade. Of course, we got to go and review those games that will be impacting their grades 100%. I do like to be able to look at players' worst games because it shows us where they have room for development. And if you end up, guys, you might end up saying like, man, like, why do you have to take such a pessimistic approach to it? If you end up watching a player's worst game and still love them, I can guarantee you, you'll love them at their best game. If you watch them and then you have some questions, you might be able to watch, hey, man, that was early in the year. Let's watch a struggle game that he had later in the year and see if the issues repeat themselves. If they do, they didn't learn from their mistakes. It's just something that you can keep as a mental frame when going forward. Then we have Tyreen Powell, linebacker at Rutgers. He had a 49 defensive grade, two defensive stops, but he allowed three receptions on three targets for 56 yards and a touchdown. Again, it's it was a really bad performance. He was a loser of the week, essentially, for me, but I ended up not really believing that it was to the point where I'd want to include it on this list. Again, it's just been a pretty small list of dudes performing poorly this week. Jonas Savania, who's been on this list now is for a positive side, is back on the negative. Uh, he, had, he allowed three pressures and a 61 pass blocking grade. Again, not really a big deal for me, but it is what it is. And then Donovan Edwards, he's had a pretty disappointing year this entire year. Eight carries, 27 yards for um, with zero missed tackles forced. So bottom line, like again, it honestly wasn't a bad week overall because, again, I'm pushing those final three out of 11. So we have really eight guys who I thought did pretty poorly this week. But feel free to get some shout outs, some other names. Again, this is not an encapsulating list of every player. These are kind of like the all stars and the all duds of the week. So uh, feel free to just like, comment, subscribe. I love you guys. See you on the far side.